Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to today's uh, Grand Rounds. Please remember to sign the attendance record and also please remember to fill out the program evaluations and give us any ideas you might have in regards to future topics and future speakers. Uh, today I think we have a uh, very timely topic. Uh, our speaker is Dr. Adora Azudi. Uh, she is a pediatrician. Uh, she attended medical school at the University of Nigeria and then obtained a Master's of Public Health at State University of New York at Albany, then did her pediatrics uh, training at the Children's Hospital in New Jersey, and she currently is uh, a pediatric infectious disease fellow at the Mayo Clinic. Uh, she has kindly accepted uh, our invitation to drive down here from Rochester today to uh, update us on uh, Ebola. And uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Zodi. Good afternoon. Um, thank you for uh, inviting me to give this talk. Um, just like Dr. Holberg mentioned, um, I'm, I'm from Nigeria, and I went to medical school at the University of Nigeria. Um, I've been here for seven years, and um, I must say that prior to uh, moving to the United States, um, I had never seen a case of uh, Ebola. And as you may have heard, Nigeria is one of the countries that um, saw a few cases of Ebola, um, although we have been uh, declared Ebola free. Um, but you know, when I found out that we had cases in Nigeria, uh, that was when I got concerned. And I, you know, I told myself I had to learn about this disease, uh, you know, not only because I had family members in Nigeria, but as an infectious disease specialist, um, you know, um, there was a likelihood that I would um, come in contact with a patient with Ebola. So um, I'm happy to share what I have learned uh, during this uh, past few months. Um, since then, you know, I've, I've had to give talks on Ebola, and I've been learning every day. Uh, information on Ebola keeps uh, evolving uh, by the day. So you know, there's a lot of uh, material out there, but I'll try to distill uh, things that you, you need to know uh, in the one hour that I, I have been assigned to give this talk. Okay, so uh, these are my objectives for today. Um, I hope that at the end of this talk, uh, you would appreciate the burden and public health in implications of this outbreak, uh, that you understand the pathogenesis, uh, clinical uh, manifestations, and principles of managing a patient with Ebola, and that you will learn the strategies uh, aimed at uh, controlling the spread of this disease. I don't have any financial disclosures, uh, but I will be uh, discussing therapies uh, for treating Ebola that are not FDA approved. Um, so I'll begin with a, a question uh, to test your geography a little bit. Um, uh, which of the following is false about the current EVD outbreak? And I'll use the term EVD to refer to Ebola virus uh, disease. Um, a, the first case was reported in Sierra Leone. Uh, B, the first case was reported in a country in West Africa. C, uh, it's caused by the species Zaire Ebola virus. And D, this is the first known outbreak of EVD in West Africa. And you can yell out the answer if, if you know it. Okay. <laughs> it says false. Which of the following is uh, false? So A is actually the answer. Um, the first case was reported in Guinea. Uh, it is uh, a country in West Africa. Uh, the current outbreak is caused by the Zaire uh, species, and it is the first known outbreak of EVD in West Africa. So a little geography. Um, this is a map of Africa. You know, it's a big continent with about 56 countries. And um, <clears throat> it's divided into five regions. Um, so, you know, this is West Africa, which is where the current outbreak is taking place. And these areas, uh, Central and East Africa, uh, is the region where all past outbreaks have occurred. 
Uh, there's been one, uh, a few cases um, in South Africa, as you'll see over the next few slides. Um, so this map from the CDC shows um, all the outbreaks uh, dating back to 1976 when the first outbreak was noted. And just like I was mentioning earlier, uh, you know, the Congo, Sudan, Uganda, uh, and Gabon, these are Central and East African countries. That's where all prior outbreaks have occurred. So for the very first time, we're seeing outbreaks in the west, uh, part, western part of the continent, uh, which is where you have Guinea, Sierra Leone, and Liberia, the three hardest hit countries. We have had cases in Senegal, uh, as well as Nigeria. Again, these are West African countries. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, uh, this table shows all the pr uh, prior outbreaks uh, starting, uh, dating back from 1976 up until 2014. Uh, there's been, you know, somewhat over 20 uh, outbreaks uh, since then. And like I mentioned earlier, if you look at all, the, all of these countries, these have been Eastern and South African uh, countries. Um, the Zaire Ebola virus species, uh, which is uh, the species causing the current outbreak, uh, has caused most of the outbreaks, and it is the um, most virulent species. Uh, and up until now, uh, the largest outbreak was uh, in the year um, 2000, and that was in Uganda, about 425 cases. So uh, try to put this into perspective when I go over the uh, next set of slides. Um, so how did this outbreak start? Um, the so-called patient zero, which you may have heard about in the news, uh, was a two-year-old uh, in Guinea, in a little, da a little town uh, close to this area called Gekadu. Uh, what is now known is that uh, this two-year-old boy uh, died from a mysterious illness uh, sometime in the middle of December. Uh, he had symptoms that, you know, we now know we are consistent with Ebola, but at the time, no one was thinking about Ebola. Um, like I said, uh, we had never had an outbreak in West Africa. So, you know, he probably presented with fever and vomiting, and, you know, whoever saw him may have thought, oh, he has malaria and things like that. But, you know, he died uh, almost immediately, and subsequently his mother, his little sister, and grandmother uh, died uh, suddenly. Um, there were a number of people who attended the funeral of the grandmother and they all contracted the disease and the next thing you know it spread to other parts of Guinea and this started all back uh, in December. It wasn't until March that uh, health officials finally recognized that this was uh, Ebola and you know made an official announcement and almost a week later as you can see the, this is Guinea and it shares a border with Liberia and Sierra Leone about a week later, uh, two or three cases were uh, noted in, in Liberia, and the disease uh, subsequently s uh, spread to the neighboring uh, Sierra Leone. So as at um, <clears throat> October 25th, this is the current situation of uh, Ebola in, uh, you know, all over the world. So as you can see, there's about 10,000 cases, and about half of those have died. Um, Liberia is the country that is hardest hit, uh, followed by Sierra Leone, uh, and then Guinea. Uh, Mali, Nigeria, and Senegal have had very few cases compared to these three countries. And I'll talk a little bit more about what happened in Nigeria, which is uh, where I come from, and how we were able to uh, get a grip on, on, on the spread. And as you, you, you may know, you know, we've had cases in, in the United States and in Spain. Um, so, uh, what's the epidemiology of this current outbreak? Uh, majority of patients are uh, aged 15 to 44 years, um, and there's no uh, difference between uh, 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 genders, so it's equally distributed amongst males and females. It has a case fatality rate of about 70%, which is similar to prior outbreaks, and what they've noted to be risk factors for a fatal outcome are, uh, being older than 45 years, and having some of the terminal symptoms, which I'll go into uh, later on, which include uh, bleeding, uh, respiratory failure, uh, coma. Uh, the doubling time, uh, basically, which is how long it takes for the incidence 
uh, rate to double, uh, has ranged anywhere from 15 days to 30 days, depending on the country. So back in uh, early October, uh, the WHO predicted that if nothing was done to control the spread of this disease, uh, by November 2nd, uh, the cases will exceed 20,000. So I think, you know, uh, going from the previous slide, which gives us uh, about 10,000 cases, I think, you know, that's um, an improvement. Uh, it looks like, you know, some of the control efforts are finally kicking in. Even, you know, I've read in the news about uh, uh, observations in Liberia, which um, suggest that uh, there are not as many cases uh, or deaths uh, as were recorded earlier on. So what are the challenges uh, that, you know, made this outbreak so bad? Uh, like I mentioned, this was the first time we experienced an outbreak in West Africa. Uh, we were unfamiliar with the disease, so it went unnoticed for a very, very long time. Um, the epicenter, like I showed you, was uh, at the um, a, a three-border region, and in, in those borders, uh, people travel freely from one country to, to, to the other for trade and to meet with family members, so it was easy uh, for the uh, disease to spread. Um, and early on in the beginning of the outbreak, uh, there was a, a lot of distrust of the government. The, the people in Liberia and Guinea all thought that this was a hoax, that you know, the government made it up <coughs> to um, you know, uh, control the population. They even thought you know, health workers actually introduced the virus. Health, health workers were being attacked and murdered. Uh, people just didn't believe uh, that this was real. And, you know, some of the behaviors that may have uh, contributed to the spread, such as uh, bushmeat consumption, which is quite prevalent in that uh, part of Africa, um, people saw this as a means to prevent them from, you know, uh, eating bushmeat or going about their normal business, visiting friends, spending time with family members. Uh, so oftentimes when, you know, you, you watch the news or talk to Liberians, they will tell you that you know, people who had relatives that were suffering from Ebola would hide them in the, you know, in, at home and refuse to take them to the hospital, or even when they were in the hospital, they would you know, break in and attack the health workers and you know, take them back home. So in the beginning, it was really tough to get a handle on, on the spread. Um, also, this is an area where there's a lot of poverty, uh, things like water and, and you know, Hygiene products, soap, are hard to come by. Um, not many medical resources, uh, not much expertise on infectious diseases or infection control. And like I mentioned earlier, um, the symptoms of Ebola are very similar to things that are endemic in that part of the world, such as malaria and typhoid. So again, um, it wasn't easy to think of Ebola at the, at the beginning. Uh, just to drive my point home, you know, these are real life pictures from you know liberia as you can see the you know the shabby living conditions that some of these patients uh lived in you know this is supposed to be a clinic where someone is being cared for but you know um hardly any care is being given people were basically left to you know die on their own the health workers were overworked um you can see you know, this mother crying, you know, and lamenting all of these children probably, you know, going through um, um, uh, a lot of difficulty and pain. Uh, at a point, the government of Liberia had to, um, you know, um, enforce um, strict measures. You know, they, they uh, set curfews and things like that, and, you know, people fought back, uh, you know, the government. Uh, you know, there were pictures coming out of the slums of Liberia with, you know, people just, you know, laying dead on the streets with no one to pick them up. So, you know, it, it's, it's been pretty bad over there uh, in comparison to what we are seeing in the United States. Um, and initially, especially in Nigeria, there was a lot of misconceptions, you know, people who believed that it was real uh, thought, well, okay, you know, let's try some homemade remedies. So I remember one time in Nigeria, there was a mass text message going around saying, you know, if you drink a lot of salt water, uh, it will protect you from Ebola. And of course, um, this is what uh, uh, was a consequence of that. You know, a lot of people believed that it was a demon and it was a curse and they could pray it away. Um, 
so switching gears a little bit talk uh, about the virus and the disease itself uh, does anyone know which of the following animals is considered the reservoir host of the um the virus the bad okay that's an easy one <laughs> um so for a long time, uh, researchers didn't know uh, what was the reservoir of uh, Ebola virus. Um, they knew that it wasn't uh, chimpanzees and gorillas because these non-human primates uh, also got sick and died from Ebola. So that was kind of a hint that there had to be a, a reservoir that maintained the virus in these areas. So um, even though it has not been proven, but it's believed that the fruit bats are the reservoir host because uh, Ebola virus RNA has been detected uh, in these bats as well as uh, antibodies. And um, in areas where they have had outbreaks of Ebola and another virus called the Marburg virus, which is a, 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 a relative of Ebola, uh, they've seen uh, increased bat populations in those areas. And in these areas where uh, the outbreaks are going on, uh, fruit bats are delicacy, so people eat them. Uh, and it is thought that that is how the virus is able to make its way out of the bat population, either into humans or, um, you know, when bat feces and, and, and body fluids come in contact with these animals and then the human beings consume them as well, uh, that is the uh, main way that it gets out of the bat population and into the human population. And then, you know, the outbreak uh, is further... Uh, are perpetuated by human-to-human -human, uh, transmission. Um, so the, the enemy, <laughs> this is the virus. Um, it's uh, named after the Ebola River in Congo. Um, that's where the name comes from. And uh, contrary to popular belief, it wasn't uh, discovered in, near the river or anything. The first outbreak occurred in a village called Yambuku in Zaire, and at that time, uh, the researchers didn't want uh, any stigma associated with the town, and that's why they decided to name it after uh, you know, a river. Um, <laughs> it's a highly virulent uh, virus. It's enveloped, and this has some infection control consequences uh, because enveloped viruses are easy to kill uh, using regular disinfectants, and it resembles rhabdoviruses and paramyxoviruses. You know, examples would be rabies and the measles virus. It's a filovirus, and that's because of the filamentous shape. And uh, there's five species. Uh, the first four are known to cause disease in humans and have been responsible for the previous outbreaks. But the Reston agent, which is named after Reston, Virginia, where it was first uh, identified, uh, has not been known to cause disease uh, in humans. This species causes disease in, in animals, monkeys and uh, pigs. How is Ebola transmitted? Um, again, we must emphasize this. It's only when you come in contact with body fluids of a symptomatic patient. Because uh, before uh, the patient becomes symptomatic, they are not viremic, they are not shedding virus in body fluids. Uh, so contacts of uh, skin or mucosal membrane uh, uh, with the body fluid of a symptomatic patient. Uh, so most of the uh, uh, transmission in this outbreak has been uh, human to human, and uh, a big part of it has been, you know, healthcare workers, uh, as you may have heard in the news. And uh, preparation of corpses for burial. This is more important in Africa, where uh, there are um, unique funeral rites, where uh, relatives wash and kiss and hug uh, a, a dead body, and uh, that has been recognized as a mode of transmission. Uh, and then uh, bush meat consumption, like, uh, like I talked about uh, earlier on, particularly when it's raw. Uh, there's no evidence that uh, it's transmitted by inhalation or by insect bites. And uh, environmental surfaces, uh, there's inconclusive uh, data that this is a mode of transmission. Um, theoretically, the virus can live on surfaces for about six days. It's been shown by you know only one study, and that's under favorable conditions in a laboratory. Uh, but you know, real world situation, they estimate maybe about 24 hours or less. So even though in theory, um, you know, if someone touches a surface and they didn't wash their hands and you touch it, in theory that can happen, but it hasn't been proven uh, to be a mode of transmission. 
Um, so what makes this virus so deadly? Um, it's because it's, it's a very intelligent virus. It disarms your immune system and disarms your vascular system. Those are the two main uh, mechanisms. So when the virus gets into the body, uh, if you recall from your immunology lecture, um, the cells that, you know, um, sort of uh, serve as the initial defense uh, on your skin, on mucosal membranes, are the dendritic cells and the macrophages. So the first thing it does is, you know, uh, destroy the dendritic cells. And these cells are very important in producing interferon, which is uh, very important in controlling viral infections. So in doing that, the cells are not producing uh, interferon, and that's why the virus replicates. And uh, the next thing it does is in to infect the macrophages. And in doing that, uh, the macrophages release tissue factors, which trigger of the uh, um, extrinsic pathway, ex extrinsic coagulation pathway. So you have, you know, uh, disseminated intravascular uh, coagulation. Uh, there's also a big inflammatory response with cytokines and nitric oxide being released. And, uh, you know, these substances go on to damage the lining of the blood vessels and cause, you know, a big inflammatory response. Uh, the third thing it does is attack the endothelial cells. So the blood vessels are leaking and, you know, the patient becomes hypovolemic and hypotension. Um, the virus spreads uh, through the blood, through the lymph, lymphatics into the lymph nodes, and you know, makes its way into the major organs in the liver. It causes significant necrosis, so coagulation factors are not being produced, which worsens uh, the coagulopathy. Again, it goes to the adrenal glands, uh, destroys the cells that make steroids, which you know, worsens the hypotension and you know, shock. Uh, also attacks the GI tract, uh, which uh, is a big uh, organ system that is involved in, in one of the, in the clinical manifestations, as, as you will see. So it causes, uh, you know, multi-systemic disease and multi-organ failure, which is why it's uh, very lethal. Um, the clinical manifestations, you know, as you would predict, from the fact that it pretty much goes everywhere, um, the incubation period can range from 2 to 21 days, uh, but in this outbreak, it's had an average of 11 days. Um, patients will oftentimes have a sudden onset of fever, malaise, you know, flu-like symptoms, basically. Uh, but in about a week is when you begin to see the GI manifestations, which is a hallmark of the disease. So nausea, vomiting, severe watery diarrhea. Um, you know, the diarrhea is, is described as you know, reminiscent of the days of cholera. The patient is putting out about eight to 10 liters of fluid uh, per day. Um, hiccups are a big part of it. And it, it was, uh, it's been said that, you know, this was what alerted the physicians in Guinea that, you know, this could be uh, Ebola because um, it's a, um, a very, um, prominent symptom of patients, especially uh, in the uh, late stages, even though you can note it in the, in the early stages. Patients hardly have respiratory symptoms, uh, although they might have sore throat, dry cough, dyspnea, and chest pain. Uh, they might have, you know, a, a rash uh, that is uh, erythematous and maculopapular, but this is uh, not always present, and oftentimes they would have this rash on the trunk uh, and the upper arms. Um, it's often said, you know, if the disease doesn't kill you, uh, you recover. So by the uh, second week is when you start manifesting uh, these symptoms. People who would get better will oftentimes uh, not progress to uh, this stage. So you can get um, encephalopathy uh, with, you know, seizures, uh, delirium, hallucinations. Some patients may go into coma, particularly um, when uh, death is impending. Um, bleeding, which, you know, has been uh, hyped a lot in the media. When you see pictures of patients with Ebola, you see gory pictures of people bleeding from all orifices. That's not common. Uh, again, only seen in the terminal stages. Um, because of the GI tract involvement, uh, they could go into ileus. Um, shock is a big part of it, especially at the terminal phase. And like I mentioned earlier, is it that you recover in the second week or you uh, die from it? If you do recover, 
patients uh, have long-standing uh, consequences from the disease. So they will have things like weakness, myalgia, uh, progressing over uh, months or even years. Um, they have extensive skin sloughing and hair loss, uh, myelitis, recurrent hepatitis, uh, psychosis, or uh, uveitis. So in this current outbreak, uh, this is you know, the uh, percentage of the manifestations, and I've kind of touched on it a little bit. Uh, fever is very common and uh, early. Um, GI manifestations are the next common. Uh, pulmonary manifestations, not that common. Uh, again, hematologic manifestations, which everyone often uh, um, associates with Ebola, uh, are not commonly seen. Uh, so what are the lab findings? Um, when you do a CBC, you would see an increased hematocrit uh, expected from the uh, hypovolemia and hemoconcentration. Uh, patients will have uh, a leukemia, um, leukopenia, uh, uh, which initially is mostly uh, low lymphocytes, but later on will be uh, uh, neutrophils. Um, they would have marked thrombocytopenia. It said that you know their Y count could be in the 1,000s and platelets in the you know 50,000s. A smear will show um, bands and immature uh, white blood cells. Uh, because of the multifocal necrosis in the liver, they will have elevated transaminases. Uh, because of the vascular leakage from the damage to the endothelium, they would have uh, low plasma proteins, which uh, causes dead spacing and 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 worsens the um, uh, hypovolemia. Uh, they are vomiting a lot, they are losing uh, electrolytes in stool, so they are hypokalemic, hyponatremic, and acidotic. Um, there's also kidney involvement, so th they, they can go into acute uh, renal failure and will uh, require dialysis. Um, because of the DIC, you see features consistent, uh, consistent with uh, uh, DIC. Um, so this uh, shows what happens with you know, uh, the virus and antibodies over time, which informs uh, how uh, you test for the virus. So when the, remember I mentioned earlier, uh, you can't spread it unless you have symptoms, and that's because um, you're not viremic until then. So when the patient begins to manifest symptoms, that's when you start notice, noticing the viremia. And at that time, uh, PCR will detect it. So as early as uh, day three, uh, if you do a PCR on this patient, uh, it, he or she will test positive for um, Ebola. The antibodies begin to rise later on, uh, about day five and day 10. And um, of course, IgM rises first, followed by IgG. The IgM will disappear in about three to six months, while the IgG will persist for many years. So uh, for early diagnosis, uh, serology is not very useful, even though it's been used to monitor uh, the response in patients who have uh, recovered. So how do you test for it? Uh, PCR should be positive from day three. If you're seeing the patient uh, and it's been less than three days uh, when they started having symptoms and you have a negative test, you should retest uh, three days later. Uh, there's a rapid antigen detection test, but it's not as sensitive as the PCR. So the PCR is the gold standard for diagnosing uh, Ebola virus disease. Uh, serology I mentioned, um, and it's important to note that uh, patients who die from it do not make enough antibodies, uh, which is why you know they are unable to fight off the infection. Uh, it can be cultured, but obviously you don't want to do that. Uh, it's, uh, it has to be done in a BSL-4 lab uh, at the CDC. Uh, you can do immunohistochemistry uh, stains, uh, but this is typically used uh, in dead patients uh, uh, in whom um, the diagnosis is unclear. So there's good guidelines for how to uh, obtain specimen, uh, how to send it, how to transport it, and all of that at the CDC, which you can uh, acquaint yourself with uh, uh, in detail later on. Uh, but uh, in general, uh, testing should be uh, coordinated with the state laboratory, and uh, they would um, uh, arrange for testing to be performed at the CDC. Uh, just wanted to show you that you know the virus is det detectable in. pretty much every bodily fluid, but it's notable that 
it stays in semen and vaginal fluid for a long time, up to about 80 days. Uh, so I think a case has been described of a patient who transmitted it to a partner, you know, many months after they had recovered from the illness. Um, so how do we treat uh, Ebola virus disease? Um, there's a good paper uh, written by Lamontan and, and his colleagues that was uh, published in the New England Journal, which uh, emphasizes that, you know, even though there's talk about experimental therapies and, and you know, all the fancy things uh, in the media, uh, none of those are FDA approved, and we don't have enough data to say that uh, they will work in every patient. So for now, supportive care is stressed to be specific care for Ebola virus uh, disease. So uh, patients need to be rehydrated aggressively. Uh, you know, a patient who is losing five to 10 liters of uh, stool and vomit, uh, if they can't drink, uh, you know, IV fluid rehydration. Uh, if they're in shock, um, you know, standard critica critical care protocol for shock, which include, you know, using pressors, uh, putting them on ventilators. Um, uh, broad spectrum antibiotic prophylaxis has been recommended uh, because oftentimes they would have uh, sepsis and uh, because of the uh, damage to the GI tract, it's been noted that they can have translocation of organisms through the GI tract. So there's a case report that was published uh, just this month by the New England Journal of a patient who uh, developed gram-negative sepsis while being treated for uh, Ebola. So oftentimes on, in the field in Africa, even here, they will be started on broad spectrum antibiotics uh, early on. Uh, the hematologic abnormalities uh, need to be addressed, you know, with platelet transfusions and all of that. If they are in acute renal failure, they require dialysis. Uh, in West Africa, they will oftentimes uh, start them on empiric anti-malarials because it's uh, endemic in that region. Um, Dr. Bruce Ribner, whom you may have uh, seen on TV, who uh, heads the biocontainment unit in, in Emory, I uh, gave a very good talk at the uh, recent IDSA uh, uh, conference in Philadelphia, and he, he described their experience in managing uh, the patients that they have had at uh, Emory, notably uh, Dr. Um, Brantley and Nancy Rideball. And you know, one of the key points of his talk is that in managing these patients, many specialists are involved. So you know, infectious disease, critical care, anesthesiology, because, you know, like I mentioned, this is a multi-systemic disease, so they need, you know, uh, intensive care. And it's important to um, define the roles of all of these specialists ahead of time uh, in anticipation of uh, caring for these patients. Uh, in his patients, he noted that they had significant hypovolemia, uh, you know, Flu losses of five to 10 liters a day. They, they were nutritionally depleted. They had to get you know, um, nutritional supplementation, uh, significant uh, electrolyte abnormalities. And, uh, you, you know, just like I'd mentioned in previous slides, they could isolate the uh, viral RNA in most of their body fluids. But except for the dialysate, and even when they did environmental testing in the rooms, even in high touch areas, um, they couldn't detect the virus, which again uh, supports the notion that it's not a, 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 a recognized means of transmission. Uh, their patients required intensive one-to-one -one nursing around the clock because uh, they had to respond to uh, rapid changes in their clinical status. Um, specific treatments, um, Ribavirin and interferon, which are you know an, uh, antivirals typically used for other viruses, have no activity against uh, filoviruses. Uh, so nothing is FDA approved as a yet. But all of these experimental uh, therapies have been tried in you know some of the patients that have been transported to the United States. You may have read about this in the news. Uh, um is a drug that acts like sidofovir, which is uh, an agent that is used. Um, for CMV viral infection. Um, it's been used in a couple of patients here. Uh, it was used in the uh, Dallas patient from Liberia who unfortunately passed away. Uh, and I believe uh, there, there's talks of using it in the uh, patient in New York, uh, Dr. Craig Spencer. Uh, it's a nu nucleotide uh, analog and the FDA has uh, given it an emergency approval for using this outbreak. Uh, a doctor in Liberia, uh, 
had some success using lamivudine, which is an um, antiretroviral drug to treat it. Um, it although it's uh, just um, uh, a, a report from you know one physician practicing in Liberia, he, he claims he had uh, only two uh, uh, mortalities out of the 15 patients that he used it on. Uh, I haven't read much about this being used either in the U.S. or anywhere else. Uh, Favipravir, this is an, uh, a drug uh, uh, being tested in Japan, uh, which has activity against influenza. It's been found um, to have activity against uh, Ebola virus. Uh, a nurse, a French nurse did receive this, and uh, she, she did recover. Uh, and the thing is, a lot of the patients who get some of these experimental therapies also get good supportive care. So it's hard to say uh, what does the trick? Is it the supportive care or the, uh, the agent? A passive immune therapy, this is when you give a whole blood or serum from a patient who has recovered. Uh, typically, they would have a lot of antibodies. So this was tried uh, in one of the initial outbreaks in the Congo in the 90s, and they had good results. So it's been tried in uh, three U.S. patients in the current outbreak, Dr. Brantley, uh, Dr. Saka, and uh, with, with good results. Uh, ZMAP, uh, which uh, a lot of people say is the most promising out of all of this, um, is a, a cocktail of three monoclonal antibodies uh, produced uh, from uh, tobacco plants. Uh, unfortunately, uh, there's not enough uh, supplies of this medication left um, to be uh, administered uh, to um, any more patients. Uh, there's a drug called TKM Ebola, which uh, was initially in phase one trial, but had to be put on hold because of uh, adverse side effects in patients, uh, has promising results. Um, and then this drug, which um, is being developed for use against hepatitis C virus, has also, also been shown to be effective in uh, non-human primates, but hasn't been tested in, uh, in humans. Uh, so how do we prevent Ebola virus disease? Uh, some of the things here are common sense, you know, massive public health response and healthcare facility preparedness. Uh, but infection control uh, of patients and persons of interest is key. And this was uh, what led to the success story uh, in Nigeria. We had aggressive con contact tracing, uh, uh, isolation, and quarantine. And uh, within uh, months, uh, we were able to squash the outbreak. So even with all of the therapies and vaccine candidates, uh, nothing beats uh, aggressive uh, infection control. Uh, you know, healthcare workers need to protect themselves, uh, safe handling of human remains and waste so as to minimize uh, transmission and vaccines. And I'll quickly rush through uh, these. Uh, some of these I'm sure is being done at your hospital already. Um, you know, there's a checklist on the CDC website of things at every healthcare facility has to go through to prepare for an Ebola patient, uh, you know, such as having appropriate uh, uh, P uh, PPE uh, training, uh, uh, having enough supplies, educating healthcare workers, ensuring that there's a policy uh, at the ED and at the lab. At Mayo, we have uh, a 40-page document uh, on our website that everyone has been encouraged to acquaint themselves with. Uh, there's a plan in place uh, for patients that may come in through any of the um, uh, units, be it the outpatient unit, the inpatient unit, patient being transferred from uh, another facility. Um, there's an algorithm uh, for uh, identifying a suspected case, and the basic gist of this algorithm is that you identify, you isolate, and you inform. So if a patient comes from any of the uh, countries where there's an outbreak and they have consistent symptoms, you isolate them first, and then you don't appropriate PPE before you go on further to obtain uh, uh, further history. And while you're doing that, you uh, also inform the appropriate authorities. Uh, there's guidelines on the website for infection control. Um, the patient should be placed on standard contact and droplet precautions. There's guidelines for environmental uh, control. Um, being an enveloped virus, it's uh, easy to disinfect surfaces that have been contaminated. Uh, by Ebola, but even then the CDC has gone a step ahead to recommend using uh, agents that are used for non-enveloped viruses, which are very hardy. So you use it, there's guidelines for the appropriate disinfectants uh, to use uh, to clean and disinfect uh, rooms where patients have been. 
Um, there's guidelines on how to appropriately don a uh, PPE and to doff it. Uh, I believe uh, a video will be showed to this effect. Uh, the main time that people contract Ebola is when they're taking off the PPE. So staff have to be competent and trained and observed while they are donning and doffing PPE. Uh, you know, recently, the CDC changed its guidelines. Initially, they had said, you know, just basic uh, PPE was okay with your neck exposed, but you know, uh, with what happened in Dallas, they have since revised that, and the guidelines are more stringent. Uh, basically, uh, no skin surface should be uh, left uncovered. Uh, there's also guidelines for how to handle um, um, remains uh, and waste. Um, in the interest of time, I'll jump through all of this. Um, and, you know, the Emory uh, physicians also uh, um, narrated their experiences uh, in caring for the patients. Oftentimes, what the CDC uh, recommends may not be practical uh, in real life. You know, for instance, you know, recommending that the basic, the, the usual hospital lab uh, can do testing, uh, whereas, you know, there were concerns that, you know, this could cause uh, problems with the lab and shut it down. Um, you know, at that point, uh, the CDC was recommending a multi-component PPE, but you know, they wore hazmat suits uh, for you know practical reasons because the nurses felt more comfortable. Um, and lastly, I'll end with the vaccines, which uh, everyone seems to be uh, interested in. So far, there are two promising candidates. Uh, one is. Uh, what's called an adenovirus uh, recombinant vaccine. So these are started phase one trials already uh, here in the US, as well as in UK and Mali. Uh, and then the second one is a VSV, vesicular stomatitis virus uh, recombinant vaccine. Uh, again, which started phase one trials this month and will be tested in Europe and Africa. So it's expected by the, the, that by the end of this year, there will be preliminary data on the uh, efficacy of this vaccine. and. Uh, the um, uh, stakeholders are working at record speed to get this uh, 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 to the next uh, phase. So, you know, in an unprecedented move, uh, they hope to plan. Uh, they plan to start uh, phase three trials in 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 December in in Liberia, Guinea, and in Sierra Leone, the three hardest uh, hit countries. And the plan would be to uh, vaccinate frontline caregivers, so physicians. Uh, grave diggers and, that, and, and those kinds of things. And obviously there was a lot of ethical questions being raised about you know, how to uh, design such a trial, uh, who gets the placebo and who gets the, uh, the, the drug and all of that. Uh, but you know, eventually they were able to come up with a plan and start the trials. So in summary, uh, this is the largest outbreak of uh, Ebola virus in history. Uh, and the first in West Africa. Um, although the case fatality is high, 70%, but you know, 30% still survive, and that's uh, with uh, early identification and aggressive supportive care. Uh, experimental therapists uh, uh, exist, but uh, only uh, based on anecdotal evidence. Uh, you know, people who received it and improved, but they also received supportive care. Vaccine trials are ongoing, and we will uh, see results soon. But up until then, uh, contact tracing and strict infection control practices are vital uh, in controlling the spread of the virus. Thank you. Um, any questions? And if you can just. Pardon me? Oh, okay. So there's guidelines that were released uh, by the CDC two days ago. Um, I won't be able to go into uh, much detail, but <clears throat> patients are placed, or rather travelers are placed into four risk categories, and that's based on their exposure history. So you would get an exposure history, you would ask them, Questions like, you know, have you been in contact with a patient with Ebola? 
how much contact? You know, is it just casual contact or living in the same house? Have you directly cared uh, for, patient, uh, for a patient with Ebola? So based on the, their answers to those questions, you would put them either at the highest risk category. Uh, there's, a, uh, a low, there's a some risk, there's a low but not zero, and there's a zero risk level. So there's four risk levels. And it's based on, on those questions. Uh, obviously, if, uh, uh, someone like a healthcare worker who has been caring for uh, an Ebola patient and hasn't been religious about using uh, PPE would be in the highest uh, risk category. So th this is detailed in the CDC guidance document. And based on that, it will uh, direct you to what the next step would be, which could range from you know, immediate isolation if they have symptoms to you know, controlled movement or uh, uh, monitored movement and things like that. So it's, it's assessing the risk is basically asking the right questions. Where have you been and what have you been doing uh, uh, in those countries? Um, my question's on the vaccine. How is that gonna be given? And will it be a one-time shot or will it be a series? Uh, I'm not aware of the exact protocol or the details. Um, like I said, it's, it's in phase one trial as, as at now. So it's been tested in only a select group of you know, healthy volunteers. So the phase three trials, which is when we will know about what you're asking, uh, will hopefully start in December. And I'm not aware of the details of, of those trials. Yeah. How, how certain is the data that there's not a, a pre-symptomatic uh, viremic phase to this virus? I mean, is there... It seemed there should have been studies, or must have been studies where people who subsequently came down with the virus or came down with Ebola were actually had their blood sampled for two or three or four days beforehand. Is that? Yes, okay. yeah, that's a good question. I'm not sure how certain, is the, how certain the data is. I don't know that there's any uh, literature out there that documents testing patients before they manifest symptoms, uh, but that's the, the general notion, but I, I'm not certain that it's based on, based on any data. I, I, I haven't read any myself, personally. Sure, go ahead. So it's, it's the uh, immunity that you get from uh, the current um, infection the lasts many, many years. Um, there's different species of the uh, virus, and there's, uh, uh, it's possible that there's different strains within each species. So in theory, that might still happen, but it's generally believed that patients who uh, recover um, do not get it again, especially particularly from that uh, species. But like I said, there's different species and different outbreaks have been caused by different species. So the immunity that you develop is specific to that species. So let's say it was a Zaire uh, species, you would have immunity to that. But if you were to be infected by a different species, uh, I don't know that that would be adequate for uh, protection. Okay, thank you.